Hello, everyone. Welcome to the debrief show of Channel 781 News. Uh, yesterday was the first city council meeting since the summer recess, which we will get into with public hearings and mayor communications. But first, we'll be talking with a resident uh, that has been pushing for greater transparency in the skate park re uh, renovation that we talked a little bit about last week. Um, so let's introduce him, Brian Daly. Thank you for joining us. Hey there. Thanks for having me. And of course, we're joined with our team of Josh Castorf. Hello. Emily Sperio. Hello. And James Kirkelly. Hello, everyone. Um, so we'll jump into the skate park renovation, and I'm going to hand that over to Josh, who has been in communication with Brian. So thank you for doing that. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Chris. So uh, when we heard that they were redoing Katusian Playground, I occurred to me that that's where the skate park is and that there's a community of people there who might have strong feelings about this. And the reason I knew that was because there's an Instagram account for the skate park, so we're, which I thought was uh, really cool. It's been going for a while. And so we're happy to have Brian Daly here, who's the person behind that account. Brian, can you just tell us a little bit more about who you are and uh, why you started that account? Absolutely. Uh, thank you for having me, first of all. You guys put out some great content. And I started the Waltham's Board Park account um, because I've been going there probably since 2005, 2004 is when I first started going down there. But there have been people going down there since 99 when it opened up. That place opened in 1999. And there has been just a community there ever since. Like some people stay, some people go. It just has been like a constant community. But what I always love about the skate community is it, it, it never really like loses its characters. Like there's guys that were there opening day who are still involved in group messages with me today, like talking about like the, the process of the new skate park. It's, it's amazing. And um, you don't really see that in any other sport or activity, um, especially around like the suburbs. So. Uh, I, I just saw it and, and I saw it through my scope and I was like, wow, I saw a lot of crazy stuff go down there when I was a kid. And I bet you there was even crazier stuff to go down in that skate park before I even showed up there. So I did a little bit of homework. I looked at some of the older cats who used to go down there and grab some of their footage. I'm like, oh my God, some crazy stuff has happened here that nobody knows about. These guys who skate there now or in high school, I'm, I'm 33 years old. So I haven't really been in the scene like I was when I was their age. These 16 year old kids who go down there, they don't they don't know what has taken place on these very grounds. So I use that as almost like a like a like a Bible or a Dewey Decimal system of all the crazy stuff that has gone down in that place. And there is some insane footage, like some really remarkable things have gone down by some incredibly talented skateboarders. Um, so I, I it just it had to be done. I have I work in social media professionally for a big brand. So I have the experience doing this kind of thing. So I was like, I'm going to make a wall dam account. And it, it grew, you know, it just kind of grew. Cool. No, I'm glad you did that. It's always cool to see people building community and acknowledging community about anything different, you know, anything new that you didn't know was in your town before. Um, so last time we did our show, it, what I knew about this was it appeared from the plans the skate park was going to be smaller. It appeared that nobody from your community had really been asked about it, but that uh, has changed since then. Can you give us uh, an update on what's going on with that now? Absolutely. So I'm in several group messages. Um, some of them, the older guys that um, are just looking to, to have like a little bit of say and longevity into like the future park. And then other chats where there's there's guys who message it being like, hey, you guys going to the skate park today? Like your classic, like they're locals there now. And um, and just being among those, like I, I'm just kind of like the the kind of the, the messenger, I guess. Like I have like the information from one chat and then I got my own information that I get from uh, Kathy Ann, who I've been working with directly. And my uh, my other guy who's like the Eric, who's got to shout out Eric. He's been putting in a lot of work too, just like me. and. We, we've been sort of like just trying to get transparency out of the whole thing. So what we've, I guess, learned here where there was a, there was a rough footprint posted and it showed Jack Ahusian Park and it showed a skate park in like a much smaller zone. And we see that and it's just a footprint really. Like it's, it, there's no plans. There's nothing. It's just like the skate park will go here roughly. The basketball court will go here roughly. And I post it online and I, I try to stay very neutral when I post things like this online. So when I posted the photo of that, um, the plans there, when they got released, a lot of people had 
negative stuff to say because what they see is a skate park that's the size of what is right now the basketball court, which is pretty small for a skate park, especially for how big the community is down there. Um, so right out the gate, people are a little upset to see that. And it said 7,000 square feet, but we didn't read 7,000 square feet as like, as we weren't looking into the metrics, we were just like, oh, it's a basketball court. Like this is, we're going to have the basketball court. That's a small space. And then take it further. There was an article released that said um, that the park was a little sleepy and like kind of like, kind of like trashy and nobody really goes down there, but, but it's just so far from the truth. And uh, naturally, like you're going to defend your tribe. So um, I, I was, I just wanted the word to get out. Like, no, there is a giant thriving skate community down there. A lot of these folks are from Waltham. A lot of them are from Newton. A lot of them from Watertown. A lot of people come to this one place, not because we have the best ramps or like, like flat ground place to skate, but it's because the community is so thriving and at the Waltham skate park. It's huge. Like you, it's a, it's a really large skate park community. It's always been that way. And to see an article released that says that, that it's, it's kind of like a, a place that's sort of a graveyard for skate ramps. It's, it's just not true. A lot of people are down there. I bet you there's people there right now, like finishing up the session. Um, so after that, I just kind of like went into it and I, I, we went for professional route. We weren't trying to be like, like going in there like anarchists or anything like that so we just like let's just figure out like what the deal is maybe they don't know maybe they simply just don't know that there's a community down there and we ended up getting in touch with um with uh kathy and harris and she's been super good to work with she's um she's really she's really been really receptive of our information that we've been giving because you look at these posts that we put up and some of these kids commenting like they could be ruthless 16 year old kids seeing the skate park getting taken away for something that's smaller um, they're going to be pissed. So you see the comments on some of the posts I put up that it, it, it can be mis kind of communicated that we mean like the skate park page is posting like negative stuff about what's happening. But in reality, we're happy that the skate park's being redone. We just want to have a say in what comes out of it because we're the ones who use it. No one else is going to use it. And there's honestly a lot of us who go down there. So we want to use the minimal space to the best possible way. So nobody's like bumping into each other and like potentially injuring one another, you know? So you feel like that connection has been established now where you're confident you will have a say or is that still kind of up in the air? Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm confident that we are going to be, we're going to be having a say in the design we've been asked to, to give, give our insight on other parks nearby that are roughly the same size as that 7,000 square feet foot mark. And, um, and I really, I really think that we're going to get something that we like here. I've used the page now to, to kind of gain like insights rather than just posting clips. Now I'm like gaining like legitimate insights of like what people want to see there. So instead of having a million, like 16 year old to 25 year old people rush in city hall, I'm going to gather all the information and use like what I've learned in my career and my profession, build a PowerPoint, show all the, the analytics, like really be like, this is like what people want this is because what they were going to build may not have been what we as waltham skate community um would necessarily use to its fullest potential for example um there's like transition skateboarding and then there's like street skateboarding and waltham's community is very much a street skateboarding community and in the um in the footprint image it was a lot of like transition skating which we don't necessarily skate so right out the gate i was like we could we could build like a, a skate plaza which is a much more aesthetically pleasing to look at. It's not half pipes and big old ramps. It's really just like, it looks like a little walking park made of concrete and um, something like that looks better. It's more like kind of tight knit. It doesn't necessarily look like your traditional skate park, but it's what we like to skate. So expo given the Kathy Ann that exposure of like kind of the expertise, like, Hey, like she's not in the skate community. Like I don't blame her for not knowing like these things. Um, I guess I, uh, I was able to open our eyes to like other possibilities to use with the small space that we're given. That's really great. Yeah, we'll really look forward to seeing how this progresses because it could really be like a how-to story um, for people who aren't usually paying attention to what's going on in government, but then they have an issue and they and they make what make it happen. It, it really sounds like a good story so far. I want to ask you about one other aspect of the community. I've noticed on the on your Instagram, there's uh kids who hang out there there's adults who hang out there there's adults who look like they're helping kids learn how to learn stuff you don't see those kind of intergenerational communities as much these days can you talk more about how that 
about those relationships and how kids and adults interact at the skate park? Absolutely. It's a beautiful thing. And it's really like, I feel like for years, like I've worked in skate shops, I've, I've worked in the skateboarding industry. Um, I, I really, it's hard to explain, but like skateboarding is such a universal language where somebody who's 16 years old and someone who's 45 years old can actually relate on this while they're actually doing the craft. It's almost like shooting hoops, you know, like if somebody's really good at basketball and they're in their like forties, if they're like, kind of like shooting around with a kid who's like a high school, like superstar kid, they can relate to that. It's the same way with skateboarding. Like, but it's, it's almost more like an art where I could look at something like a wall that's in the corner of the skate park. I'm like, oh, that could be fun to skate. And then another guy, he could be 10 years older than me or 10 years younger than me. He could be interested in that kind of like approach to the, to the skating as well. So like you just look at unlike things to skate and it helps, it helps you just like build relationships with people. Like it just happens so naturally in skateboarding. It's, it's a real, it's a real art. It's like a different, like, part of your brain it's like the real left side of your brain is like activated when you're trying to figure out like what to skate and it's a very relatable thing when somebody else like has that same experience that's great thank you do other people have questions for brian yeah i I had a couple questions um so when this plan was unveiled um in a video kathy ann was talking a lot about what the park was going to look like and how the money was already um transferred and how it was all approved it wasn't taxpayer or anything um and it seemed very final in in that sense so when i heard that um she was taking input from you guys um which which is good but i had assumed that the plan for the skate park was already set in stone and there was no way to change it uh is that not the case is there being are there changes being made to the already uh, agreed upon plan and how does that work do you understand how it works yeah so uh, pretty much there was just a footprint of like, this is where the skate park is going to be. They never hired a company to design it or build it. They were, they were going to pretty much go with, um, with, with, with whichever company looked like the best fit for whatever their budget was. So what they have is essentially a zone this big, that is like a skate park. So there's no like real design. I, I think somebody in the office maybe just put like a graphic of like what a skate park might look like in like a drafting mm-hmm. plan. Uh, There's been no finalized um, design or anything like that. They haven't even locked in a contractor or a company to do so. So we actually just happened to come in at the perfect time. And like, to be honest with you guys, like a lot of the times, like my natural, like skateboarding self is just kind of like, like come in like a bat out of hell. But like the adult side of me now was kind of like, all right, like maybe we could actually work with the, the city and come up with something that these kids can actually really use rather than just kind of waiting down the line, like kind of like be lazy. And then like years later, we're complaining that we have a shitty skate park again, (laughs) because technically the one in Waltham right now is a bad skate park. It's the crack, there's cracks that are like people, it's a brutal skate park. It's fun because there's a good community there, but like the actual ramps are horrible. And um, Mm. so I just like took it into consideration. I'm like, I, if, if I was coming up in the, in the scene, I would hope somebody would do this. That's my age. I, I think it's just the right thing to do. I, I owe the skate park community this from being in there for over 20 years. So why the hell not? And um, yeah, so they, they, um, they haven't locked in a final plan yet. Wow. I'm thankful to be a part of that conversation. I got a meeting tomorrow about it. And, um, and yeah, we're, di- we're going to just really give our input. And I've been collecting a lot of data of like what could look good in that small space that we have. Well, that's awesome to hear that she is receptive. Kathy Ann is generally uh, follows through on that kind of uh, input. Um, you know, as a general rule, a lot of politicians, you know, can make it seem like they're listening to you. So I hope that your input is valued and actually, you know, is reflected in the new skate park. And I hope we can stay in touch uh, to talk about that and put a fire under Kathy Ann to get that citizen input. Um, I'm sure through the skate park community, you've learned a lot about municipal government and some of the younger folk probably learned a lot about municipal government here. The city council elections are next year. Can we count on a dedicated voting block of the skate park community come November? Voting in general, or are we <laughs> yeah. talking about like which side we talking here? Yeah, no, 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 just, just a dedicated group of skaters to come and vote on in November. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I think this, this whole experience really 
um, exposed me and some of the um, guys my age that are in the community and, and the older guys have already been a part of it. But yeah, I'd say this, me translating everything to some of the dudes that are of age uh, to vote, because like a lot of these guys are in the mid twenties, I'd say a hundred percent. Yes. Like we're all very involved at this point. We all know like who's, in, who's where and what district, like the South district, obviously Kathy, like we, we, we all learned a lot in the last couple of months um, based on a few things yeah, that me yeah. and my partner, Eric have been, sort of uh translating back and forth so we we've really definitely been exposed to the um the politics of all them love it it's good to see the community organizing like this and it's also good that she's been listening to you and taking your feedback hope so yeah absolutely i'll be interested to see what comes of the rfp process and who the contractors are that are in the running yeah uh, thankfully, there's a, a skater who grew up skating Waltham who has made numerous skate parks in the area. He actually built the Somerville Skate Park, which is exactly 7,000 square feet. And that's known as like a decent skate park. Cool. Um, and he just footage of him. I, I posted myself skating Waltham Skate Park back in like the late 90s. So um, that would be my first choice for the, the company to use. I believe it's Artisan is the name of the company. But uh, I'm going to I'm going to give them a, a little lookbook of of different people that I think, you know, instead of just grabbing a random Joe Schmo who doesn't know, like build, get someone who's built skate parks before. That sounds great. Well, thank you, Brian. We definitely want, this is definitely a story we want to follow and, you know, all the way until the thing is built. And I hope it, uh, it goes as well as it seems to be going at the moment. So thanks a lot for joining us and filling us in on this. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, fingers crossed that it stays smooth. And if it doesn't stay smooth, you're going to hear from me no matter what. So <laughs> awesome. thank you very much. And so with that, I'll hand it back to Chris uh, to move on to our next topic. And now getting into the meeting um, yesterday, the first meeting of the city council since the summer recess, uh, there was, um, as most First meetings and last meetings, there were um, many public hearings. Um, we'll get into some of them, but most of them having to do with pot shops, a recurring theme here. Um, and a few more interesting things from the mayor, uh, mayor's communications. Uh, but I'm actually going to start at the end um, to transition us into this. Um, there was an executive session meeting, which means that it was uh, unrecorded behind closed doors, everyone has to leave, um, about the Elk building. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that later. Um, but this is just about the process of executive session. They always wait till the end um, for the kind, out of the kindness of their hearts. So the people that are there don't have to wonder when they're gonna come back if they have other important things to talk about. Um, so they went into executive session around like nine, 9.30. Um, to talk about the uh, the Elks um, building. And I was interested in two of the things at the very end of the docket. So I wanted to just wait it out. And I was at home just uh, live screaming it. Um, and so, you know, 9.30 comes, they're still in executive session. 10 o'clock comes, they're still in executive session. 10.30 comes, they're still in executive session. At 11.30, I'm like, I've got to go to bed. Um, and so I just gave up and I was hoping that maybe someone had uh, stayed up long enough that they would, be able to tell me about the two things that I was interested in. Um, and so no one could tell me anything, anyone I asked. And then I, eventually I got to someone, uh, I just asked one of the counselors, I was like, when did you guys get out last night? And they said, oh, 1030. Um, and I, I asked them, I was like, but the live stream never came back. And they're like, yeah, I don't think, I don't think they ever turned it back on, but we just ended a meeting really quick and that was it. And so I'm going to dock the city council for transparency on that uh, because generally they come back and they end the meeting and then they close. Uh, but it could have been anything. They could have been talking about anything. I would have no idea. No one ever had any idea. Um, so I'm very disappointed that they did not come back. Um, but to get to the two things that are interesting, which apparently they did not talk about at all, um, and this is related to what we talked about last week, um, the Armory Project, we talked a little bit about how Watch wanted to develop it into housing. And what we really didn't get into uh, last week is that Watch was still trying to accomplish that goal. Um, and that was over a year ago. So they've been, you know, doing countless man hours, countless dollars spent on this Armory Project. And just in this docket, um, the mayor shared a communication 
from the executive director of Watch, exclaiming that they are just abandoning the project completely. It is, uh, the lock process has taken too long. It's now costing them too much money. And apparently the owner is being difficult. And so um, just as it closed to our discussion last week, the Armory project is dead. Um, there are no plans right now for it. It is just taking up space as it always has been for the past X number of years. <clears throat> the um, the other thing uh, that's at the end of this docket that's kind of interesting um, is that the mayor wants to construct on 240 Beaver Street, the Waltham Field Station, uh, wants to construct a maze, a labyrinth, um, in recognition to Cornelia Warren. Now, this is, I'm actually going to talk about Cornelia Warren a few times today, so I'm going to preface this with a little bit of a backstory. Cornelia Warren was a um, philanthropist, farmer, education activist, um, in general rich person of uh, Waltham's past, probably maybe the most famous philanthropist um, in our city. Uh, and most famously um, left behind the plot of land at 240 Beaver Street, which is now our farm and uh, Field station, home to many other nonprofits. Um, and generally, just a cool person. And I also want to replace the Columbus statue with a statue of uh, Cornelia Warren, but we can talk about that in October. Um, and so apparently, um, the mayor was doing some reading into Cornelia Warren and found that she had on 240 Beaver Street, which is land that Cornelia Warren owned, she had built a labyrinth um, and a maze for the public to use. And so she has uh, sent a communication to the uh, city council that she plans to replicate that on the same property. Um, and so I'm very curious about how that's going. And it actually relates again to what we were talking about last week about how the mayor decides to do things. Um, because with 240 Beaver Street, the Waltham Field Station, for a little bit of backstory there, is that it's been a long five, six year, from the public view, it's probably been more like decades uh, for the people on the ground of trying to get that land from UMass, uh, UMass who owned it, sell it to the city so we can use it for farmland because there was talk that it was gonna turn into a parking lot for Bentley. Um, and so for the past five, six years, uh, there's been a lot of on the ground uh, advocacy to try and turn that into um, the field station permanently through municipally owned leases. Um, and so, it, I mean, like two years ago, they celebrated a victory, but literally tonight, they're still like shifting things around and dotting I's and crossing T's. And so it's still going on for the, everyone that is celebrating victory. And, you know, it's not all set in stone. They don't have a contract. Um, and so it's very interesting to me that this, the mayor is already, you know, she owns the land and, you know, they were talking about working together with all the nonprofits, but she's already deciding to just like do stuff with the land. Like, oh, it's in the far Northwest corner. Like, you know, that nobody uses. We're just going to, I'm just going to, Put something there and while that thing might seem cool I, i'm interested in what this is going to look like um, a municipally owned maze um but i wanted i'm curious about do the farmers want that do the nonprofits want that do the, does the coalition of tenants that own the field station do they want this maze just like in their corner are they worried about you know the traffic foot traffic uh, that with people just stepping on the on the land uh, that is growing produce and vegetables oh, I'm, I'm very curious like, is anyone gonna caution the mayor to just not do stuff with this land? Is she just allowed to? Um, and so that is two things that did not come up on the city council that could have if uh, they came back. Maybe they did. Is this, so we don't even know, is this a corn maze? Is that why um, it's so, corn it's Yeah, something? so it's on the docket and uh, there is uh, on the e docket, there is this communication from the mayor and in it is, I have no idea what this is. I don't know if this was an old book. It's called the Warren family and Girl Scouts while they're masters. It talks about the maze. Um, and I have not done enough research into this, so I'm not going to say it, uh, what it is, but in the city council uh, communication, it's going to be a smaller version of this big maze. One of the things that I thought was, uh... That, that, that did come up that was one of the more sort of core functions I consider of city government was they were uh, 
uh, get approving funds for a culvert project in Chesterbrook. And that's like for flood mitigation is pretty important in cities and like where people live. And we've had you know, multiple pretty disastrous floods in just the US in the, in the last year. And it's, this was funds that were from uh, the MVP uh, funds at the state level from Baker uh, for climate mitigation. So uh, hopefully we see more stuff like this. A bulk of the public hearings for uh, last night's meeting were involving pot shops. Um, and as our resident pot shop expert, I'm going to give it to Emily to talk a little bit about that. So the, there's two hearings for Flora Holdings LLC and Waltham Cannabis. Um, and really they were just uh, back in front of city council for really small um, changes to their plans, although Waltham Cannabis, not quite as small, is looking to um, move the building entirely. That would be their main retail building, so not quite as small. Um, but what, what came up, uh, there was sort of a theme between both um, of their public hearings was that they were both back for plan changes, um, some of which were smaller, and that they were back because um, simply because the law department required to required them to, and specifically, um, the attorney for Waltham Cannabis made a statement that his um, his client Damon Schwitt, Schmidt is a social equity applicant. He is, I think, he fits the criteria because he's um, from Waltham. I believe is how he fits the criteria, um, and basically alluded to the new state legislation around social equity applicants. Um, so it felt a little bit like a veiled threat, like I'm gonna bring the Cannabis Control Commission down on you, although I'm not clear on how that would work because the new legislation really focuses on making a new social equity fund. It does make sure that the Cannabis Control Commission plays more of a part in um, looking at the host community agreements, but it doesn't necessarily have, I, I don't know if there's anything that Cannabis Control Commission could do in terms of pre-host community agreements, proceedings being dragged out, but that was what stood out to me last night. Um, I thought it was interesting seeing some pushback from residents. Um, as with all public hearings, there is time for public input, which is the only time for public input in the Waltham City Council is these kinds of things. Um, and there was uh, one gentleman who took a heroic stand of standing when you're supposed to stand when you're not uh, in favor of things, just one lone gentleman fighting the fight. Um, and then one gentleman speaking about uh, that he was not necessarily against marijuana, but the, these marijuana developments uh, did not structurally make sense to him. Um, and, in, uh, and while I, you know, encourage that kind of dialogue, it, three, four years ago, I don't know, you probably remember this date better than I do, uh, when we first started having these public hearings, we, we used to pack the chamber with people that were so against marijuana um, in Waltham, and they would, during these public input uh, sessions, they would you know, some have very valid things to say, some have very unvalid things to say. And so I think it's interesting that, you know, two, three years later, you know, we're talking, we're normalizing, you know, smoking weed in Waltham. Now there's, uh, during the same process, now there's like one person, maybe two, uh, talking about um, the difficulties. And it's not just like weed is bad. And for even more context, um, when we were talking about legalizing marijuana in Massachusetts, Waltham passed it in the city council, passed a resolution urging the residents to vote no on, uh, on legalizing marijuana. And I wish I could uh, obtain the, um, 
city council meetings from then, but uh, WCAC, our local access, only saves a year's worth of meetings on their website and to obtain the other ones requires you to like reach out and like buy things. Um, so I can't do that, but it, I mean, it's it's pretty intense. The people, uh, John McLaughlin, for example, the Workforce City Councilor, talking about how weed is a gateway drug and he cannot believe that, that Waltham is even considering um, selling it and, uh, Robert Logan, Ward 9 city councilor, talking about, oh, they were going to put weed and candy and give it to kids, and it's going to be a disaster, and they're going to put pot shops everywhere. The zoning just allows them to do whatever they want. Um, and so all that to say, I am glad that now we're at a point when, even though it's being totally obstructive, um, the backlash seems to be more calming. I think for one thing, neighboring municipalities that have dispensaries opened have demonstrated that the world doesn't go up in flames because one, two, or even 12 dispensaries opens up in your municipality. I mean, Northampton has, I think it's 12 now. Um, they're talking about setting caps, but, you know, if the world's melted down, it's not because people can use cannabis. And I, and I think that's been hard for anyone to deny. Um, right. One of the things yeah. that they were that they brought up was that they're right next to the development for the market basket as well. And they, it sounded like they felt that there had been insufficient uh, consulting with them for that, which is a much bigger project, much more disruptive, and still is probably creating way more traffic in this particular shop. And that, that was something that like, you know, and, and is that also provoking people to bring it up in meetings for unrelated things years later, so. Yeah, I mean, that guy that came and spoke about how he's not necessarily against weed, but just like, you know, the plan for these buildings. I hope he comes for all of the other plans for all these other special permits for all these other big buildings that are the exact same thing or worse. I don't think I'm gonna see him though. I think if it's not marijuana, I'm probably not gonna see that. One thing that was additionally frustrating was hearing from city councilors like uh, LaFosse, you know, Kate's has been, you know, going down this path too, is um, hearing that they were concerned that, um, you know, and they're saying now that they're concerned that this property abuts residential resident, you know, other residents. Well, for one thing, those residents have been notified, you know, and they they not only notify within, um, I think it's 500 feet required legally, um, they, Waltham Cannabis told council last night that it, it sounds like it may have been Councillor Mackin previously had it, it advised them, you know, just as the councillors overseeing the ward at the time, that they reach out to neighbors in an even greater distance. So they had, um, so it's not a new issue and to hear the counselors now uh, using the opportunity of second, third public hearing for some of these dispensaries to bring up what they're, you know, passing off as new issues that are not issues like um, residential neighbors, you know, for example, Garden Remedies has residential neighbors. Um, that neighborhood has not gone down in flames. They've got, you know, nice um, lunch amenities now. They've got a whole bunch of new buildings. Uh, not only that, Boston is looking at doing away with the buffer zones altogether, which is something that uh, Waltham could do. So while, while, while Boston is doing away with buffer zones, we are um, suddenly looking at tightening things up when the zoning is already, you know, or zoned to death. So that was- I thought that, Yeah, um, I thought that was hilarious when they were grilling uh, one of the uh, applicants for not having a public hearing in like two or three years. Was like, this shit's not supposed to take two, three years. Like they're supposed to do the public hearing get their permit and move on. Yes or no, move on. Not drag this out. Millions of dollars spent on lawyers and building fees and probably no in the end. They had uh, Connors and Connors, I think, representing them too. And I see them all over the place because they were oh, in yeah. them. And 
it, it was funny seeing them that contentious over it too because usually it goes a lot smoother i'd say and yeah. the uh one thing one of the points was like brought up about how uh the one the, this is the main street one we were talking about uh Waltham cannabis and it was brought up that it was on the rail trail and uh the lawyer appeared to not be aware of that which yeah I mean, that was weird <laughs> but it was interesting that O'Brien brought up that uh, to, to, to estimate the total traffic going to the place for, and it sounded like probably for the purpose of parking would, would that that might be affected by bike traffic if they estimated to the majority of that. So that could also be an interesting outcome. So very quickly on the docket is uh, ARPA funds, which is uh, the federal government giving municipal government money for uh, COVID relief. Um, we have a significant amount of money. Let me find it. Almost $2 million, $1.8 million um, on fire and police radios. Um, and while I wouldn't necessarily say I'm against um, our fire department having uh, adequate radios, um, I just want to point out that like the city of Newton um, with their, uh, their ARPA funds how they spend it. There's a much more greater transparency than Waltham. They have every single dollar spent on ARPA funds uh, listed and it's all the hyperlinks of what the actual things are. Waltham has none of this. Um, and Newton is not even the, the king of transparency. Other cities have a participatory budget for how to spend ARPA funds, not all of it, but a portion of it. I mean, Waltham just kind of seems, it's kind of like just like a slush fund for the mayor's projects um, that she can just decide to do. Uh, so I wish that there was, um, you know, wish we knew that $2 million were going to be spent on this instead of something else. And, you know, just a little bit of accountability for this kind of money. Um, moving on to the one resolution of the uh, evening was a resolution on accessible mailboxes. And this was a effort uh, spearheaded by Paul Cates uh, with Joey LaCava uh, signing on as well. I believe Joey LaCava signed on because I believe the um, post office is in his board. And according to his speech, he had some uh, people reaching out to him, I assume because it exists in his board. Um, but I'm just gonna read it really quick. It's not a long resolution. And I think, I, it, I'm, I'm spoiler alert, I think it's a good resolution. Um, so this is, a. Uh, and I'll share my screen as well for people watching uh, visually. Um, resolution to provide accessible mailboxes in Waltham, whereas for several years, citizens and visitors of Waltham benefited from a snorkel style drive up mailbox uh, at the central post office location on Main Street, whereas the style of mailbox was both a benefit and necessity to those with disabilities, injuries, and medical or other hardships, whereas the collection box was removed by the postmaster of Boston without providing an acceptable alternative and stating, quote, there is not a plan in place to replace the um, collection box, now therefore be resolved. The city council requests that the postmaster of Boston attend a city council meeting and or install at least one snorkel post uh, box to enable accessible drive-through mail drop-off in Waltham at the central post office on Main Street. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm actually satisfied with this resolution. I think um, it's done, it's worded in a way that I think it could be effective. Uh, it does have the Postmaster General of Boston being invited to our city council. And as Joey Pop after him said, probably not going to happen. There's really nothing holding this person accountable. Why Why there's no pressure being applied, no real pressure, probably not going to happen. But could this resolution lead to something? Yes. Um, a good example of something like this occurring is John McLaughlin, Ward 4 City Council, that we just talked about earlier about uh, pot shops. Um, with the train horns uh, being silenced, a very similar looking resolution uh, was sent into the city council and he succeeded in getting his objective completed by doing a lot of back end communications with officials. Paul Cates is going to fail at this if he just goes through committee and just like hopes to do something if he just puts more communications in. It's going to require him to be talking to the post uh, postmaster of Boston. Um, it's going to require him to attend a lot of uh, phone conversations with them. Um, but I think with the language in the resolution, with uh, some go-getism of uh, Paul Cates, I think this would definitely be successful. And I mean, I think it would be a slam dunk if it did. 
I would also like to say, I hope uh, Paul Cates uh, takes up more disability rights um, because it seems like it's something that he's interested in and I would like to see him more on the forefront of it. And finally, um, we talked a little bit about the Elk property today, but the um, the Elks Lodge is, uh, I'm gonna find the address, but it is right next to Government Center at 101 School Street. And so they went into executive session meeting, uh, an executive session to talk about the possible purchasing of this. Um, we know this because Kathleen McMiniman uh, used those words. Um, generally, you don't really know what's going on in executive session, but Kathleen used words in such a way that it's talking about the potential buying of this property. And so we know nothing about it because it's an executive session. We know they talk for about an hour. So this could go on for years, literally years, but Hopefully not. Um, but what we can talk about is what we think is going to happen. So I asked all of our panelists to write down on a piece of paper what they think 101 School Street is going to turn into if the city bought it. So I think what we're going to do is let's just put up these to the screen and then I'll just read them off for people that are just listening. So let's do that now. <laughs> Forgot my literal piece of paper. It was parking lot. Parking lot. <laughs> got, we can't I got see parking yours, lot. Chris. What do you have? Parking lot. Okay. I got parking lot. Josh has got parking lot. Emily's got placeholder. What is placeholder? What is placeholder? I, I don't know, but I want to find out more. It's currently oh, okay. a fifty percent parking lot. I'm holding out for at least seventy five percent parking lot. <laughs> so it is the general opinion of Channel Seventy One News that it's probably going to be a parking lot. I would certainly like to see it be. Almost anything else. Almost anything. A uh, labyrinth. I'm pretty sure it's going to be a lot. Um, so I think that's our show. Uh, I think we went through a lot here today. So thank you very much for that. I'm looking forward to more uh, debriefs on city council meetings. Hopefully more interesting things. Hopefully more things that pertain to the everyday lives of working class wealth mites. Um, but for now, it's mostly pot shops and um, pot shops. So thank you very much. And we'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.